Uh, so welcome to our tutorial, you know, practical deep learning for data scientists. Uh, my name is Andrea. I am, you know, a training and enablement engineer at a company called Domino, um, which is a data science platform company. Um, I actually come from a background of biomedical engineering, um, but I sort of got into data science um, doing like neural recordings, had a lot of data. Um, so that's how I found myself here. Um, today I'm going to be presenting with Josh and I'll let him introduce himself. Uh, if you'd like, Josh. Sure. Hi, everybody. My name is Josh. I am a field engineer at Domino, um, and I, I got into Domino or into data science from uh, like graduate school work in, in applied optimization uh, in medical devices and things like that. Uh, I will pass it back to Andrew. Great. All right. Um, and in terms of questions, um, you know, I'm going to keep an eye on the chat. Josh is going to be monitoring that as well. So feel free to post those throughout, um, especially if it's relevant to something we're talking about. And I'll probably pause at the end of this section um, to take questions if you do want to go off mute at that point and ask them. Um, but yeah, don't hesitate to post those. Um, oh, and we had one already. Uh, yes, yes, we're going to make sure you get the materials afterwards. So and um, we do have a Git repo set up. Um, but for the tutorial itself, we're actually going to be working in sort of a virtual platform. It's going to be Domino. That way you can do some hands-on stuff, get access to GPUs, um, but then you'll be able to keep all of the notebooks, all of the material afterwards. So this is sort of an overview of what we're gonna be going through. Um, I'm gonna start with an introduction just about deep learning or neural networks in general. Then we'll get into deep learning and practice, uh, you know, what these layers are. We're gonna be mostly focusing on uh, CNNs today, convolutional neural networks, um, but we'll talk a little bit about other types of networks. And at the end of each of these, we're gonna have some hands-on activities. Uh, we'll get into evaluating models, um, optimizing models. We have kind of a fun little competition at the end of that section and then the summary here. Uh, so that's sort of how we'll go through this. Uh, so I'll start with the introduction. We'll keep this you know, fairly brief um, in case you're familiar with deep learning, but you may have some folks totally new to it. Uh, so deep learning is really just a type of machine learning that's inspired by the structure of the brain. Uh, you have these algorithms that perform a task numerous times via a system of weighted connections. So they're gonna do this, they're gonna make improvements each time. Uh, it's essentially referred to as deep learning um, because these inputs are processed via deep layers. So you know, these neurons are not linked randomly, you have all these layers, so it's not anarchy. Uh, when a, a layer's neurons are not connected, um, a lot of them are gonna be connected to neurons like the next layer or the previous layer. So we're gonna get into that a little bit. When should you use um, deep learning? Uh, a lot of times you can think about that this is a task for complicated data where you have unclear features. I just found this kind of amusing, so we threw that in uh, in terms of you know comparing it to classical machine learning or reinforcement learning or ensembles. So complex tasks, um, but keep in mind with deep learning, it's not going to be that interpretable. So you need to make sure that's not something you require from your model. And you also need to have the time and the resources to train this. It can take a long time, especially if you don't have access to GPUs, um, which we'll get into and we'll do a little comparison a bit later. Uh, so just some general examples uh, of deep learning. You're going to see this in object identification, facial recognition, um, also things like virtual assistants, you know, those apps that you have for identifying songs like Shazam, um, deep fakes, kind of a, a new thing, maybe a little bit of a problem, uh, self-driving vehicles, personalized entertainment, all of that. Uh, so just a couple of funny ones. This is one that's actually was recently in the news. Um, I mostly really enjoyed that kind of meme there. Uh, but essentially, someone in Japan developed this algorithm to speed up checkout at bakeries. And this was presented on you know, a television show somewhere. A doctor saw this and realized, hey, you know, cancer cells look kind of like bread. Maybe we could use it um, in my work. Um, and then they, they were able to take that algorithm and repurpose it. So it's kind of an interesting New Yorker article. Um, if you have the time to check it out, it's linked there. Uh, another interesting example um, is in producing sound. So we'll kind of compare the image and the audio. Uh, so for robots to navigate the world, you know, they have to be able to make these assumptions about their surroundings and what might happen next. So at MIT, uh, they've been developing this algorithm that will produce sound for a silent video. Um, they actually made it realistic enough to fool human viewers. And so this is an example of what that is. You have your silent video, the predicted soundtrack, you know, of something being hit. Uh, but to do this, it took many months, a lot of data, you know, 1,000 videos, an estimated 46,000 sounds. Uh, so definitely not an easy task. All right, um, we're going to just briefly discuss what a neural network is. 
think it can be helpful um, to understand these layers a little bit better when you start building out the architecture, even though you know a lot of that is automated nowadays. Uh, we're just going to do a little bit of a review. So this is an image. Um, this is a really famous uh, data example where you have these hand-drawn digits, and these are mapped to the actual um, class, so what digit it is, and you can import these thousands and thousands of pictures and use this to test or train models. Um, and it's actually built into a lot of these um, deep learning modules in Python. Um, so we're looking at this image, it's 28 by 28 pixels. And so that's, you know, 784. Um, so we can think of each of those pixels as becoming a neuron. And that neuron is going to have an activation that represents the grayscale value of that corresponding pixel. So, you know, this one is about in the middle, so it's around 0.58. And the neural network we're going to talk about right now is a multi-layer perceptron as an example, and then we'll discuss how some of these more advanced layer networks um, architectures sort of differ from this. So we have our neurons, we have our very first layer, um, which you can see here. So we've got a first layer, 784, each is a pixel. Then we have our last layer, um, and that last layer is going to be made up of 10 neurons. And that's because we have 10 potential outputs. In this case, it's going to be numbers you know, from 0 to 9. Uh, but what about these hidden layers? So we can see in this simple example, uh, there's two hidden layers. Um, each of those has 16 neurons. Um, and again, you know, this is a multi-layer perceptron. You can see everything is connected. Not super commonly used today, but it's a really good base for understanding sort of how these hidden layers work, how things are connected. So we can see here that activations in one layer determine the activations in the next layer. So some group of neurons firing causes other neurons to fire. And then the brightest, brightest neuron in that output layer is going to be the network's choice for what dim, digit that image represents. All right, so to summarize that part, you know, we have these middle layers that are ideally, hopefully, representing subcomponents of the input. So in this case, and this is ideal, this actually isn't what it would be like in the real world, um, but maybe that second hidden layer represents like a line or a loop or whatever is making up the digit. And that first hidden layer um, represents edges that make up these subcomponents of digits. And that way you have this final layer that can link to that combination of subcomponents. Um, and this is what it looks like here, um, just as an example. So we have our edges in this first hidden layer, and we have that top loop, which makes up a nine, and then that horizontal line. Um, and this is lighting up the nine here. So this is sort of in theory. Um, so we can take you know, just that general base of these hidden layers, and you can think about image recognition as, hey, we're going to be detecting all these different edges and then piecing them together. You know, speech recognition, you're going to have this raw audio, but you could start breaking it down into like sounds and then form syllables and then form words and phrases and so on. Um, as a, a simplified example there. Cool. So now we know we have a general idea of our layers, what we want them to do, um, but how can we ensure that they're capturing these desired patterns? Uh, and this can be done through something called weights. Um, so you would assign weights to the connections from the first layer to the, say, this neuron in the second layer here. So each of these is going to be connected. This is a fully connected layer, um, and they all have a single weight here. Then you can take the activation of each of those neurons as it's coming into this neuron in the second layer. You can multiply it by its assigned weight. And you can kind of think of these as a grid um, where green represents positive weights and red negative weights. Um, because we, you know, we have this essentially image and all of these inputs coming into a single neuron. Um, but think about any of those sums, you know, they could be any number. Um, so we want to make sure that we get an activation between zero and one. So we would put those sums through a function. Um, so the example shown here is a sigmoid function. So you know, very negative numbers are going to be close to zero. Very positive numbers close to one. Uh, most networks don't actually use these sigmoid functions nowadays, uh, but it's a really nice sort of example here. Think of it as a measure of like how positive that relative weighted sum is. Um, often this is actually what's used. This is a rectified linear unit, um, a lot faster to train. And we're going to cover this in more detail later. Um, we're also going to talk about the importance of nonlinearity a little bit later. But, you know, that's kind of intuitive. You can think about, hey, if it was just a linear function throughout my network, um, that would just be a linear regression. So 
we'll get into that a, a bit later in the um, deep learning and practice. Okay, so now we've got our weights, we have our connections, but we don't necessarily want a neuron to light up just when the activation sum is greater than zero. I'll, you want to set some kind of threshold. And to do this, um, you set a bias. So the bias is going to tell you how high that weighted sum needs to be before it's meaningfully active. So if we think about that first hidden layer, you know, we've got a single bias for each neuron, so that's 16 neurons, and then we've got 784 weights per neuron. Um, so just in that layer alone, we have 784 times 16 weights plus these 16 biases. So when we think about neural network learning, um, it's really getting the computer to find a valid setting for each of these weights and biases. So in this very simple network, um, we have a total of 13,000 and two parameters. So you can see how this can quickly balloon and get very, very large. So we have our weights and biases. We know that we have these different inputs to like neurons as we go through different layers. And if you were to think of a neuron as a function, um, one that is essentially taking in the outputs of all the neurons of the previous layer and returning this number between zero and one, this is what it would look like. So we have the function at the top and um, we have this shown um, in matrix math. And then we have this like simplified one here at the bottom, still sort of showing this sigmoid function that it's going through. So all of these weights times the connection plus the bias. Um, so just to kind of reiterate, you know, the weight describes the strength of connections from neurons in the previous layer. The bias describes whether the neuron tends to be active or not. Um, and then these form a function for each neuron, which is transformed into a value between zero and one. It's going to indicate the activation of the next neuron. Um, but you might be wondering, you know, how does the network actually learn these weights and biases? So these start out random. Um, they're initialized um, in this way. You know, you're going to go through and you're going to get this output. Um, it's initially going to be very wrong. And we're going to compare that to the correct answer. So we're going to have all these different values for those 10 neurons in the final layer. And they're going to be probabilities but we know our final answer should be all zeros with one of them being a one, you know, the correct digit. And so um, we're going to generate a cost function by comparing those. And that's really just going to show the cost of the difference. Um, so really just the squares of the differences between those two. And then the average cost over all of your training examples, so say you fed in 10,000, um, that's going to be used to evaluate, evaluate how the network performed. Um, so you can kind of see that here. Um, we've got like our initial wrong output, you know, all these different activations, but we want one to be, you know, just this one for three. Um, and so we take those differences here, we square them, and now we have a cost. Um, so this cost function, you know, it's going to take in all the weights and biases and give us a single number. Um, and we need to minimize this. And so to minimize this, we're going to do that through something called gradient descent, um, which we'll get into in a moment. Um, but you can think about, you know, the negative gradient of the cost function, sort of telling you what changes to the weights and biases will induce the fastest change to the value of the cost function. So we're just minimizing that cost function here. Um, and this is kind of highlighting that you can see this gradient vector here, um, which can be a little hard to wrap your head around. You know, it's going to be really, really big, you know, 13,000 for the simple network. Um, but it's really just encoding the relative importance. So it's saying, hey, this weight should increase a little bit. This weight should increase a lot or decrease a lot, um, depending on you know, the value shown here. Um, and what makes this possible is something called backpropagation. So you can think of this as, or it stands for backward propagation of errors. This is an algorithm for calculating the gradient of that error function. And it's done so from the last layer backwards to the first layer. So it essentially determines how a single training example, so in this case, just one image um, associated with its correct number, um, would like to alter the weights and biases based on that cost function. And it includes the relative proportion of those changes um, to see what would cause the most rapid decrease, decrease to the cost. Um, so this is kind of showing you, hey, what we would like to happen with our activations is maybe we need it to go up a lot for the correct one and these need to go down a lot. Um, note, you can't actually change those activations, but this is kind of just like a, an illustration. So we're going to note, hey, what is this desired change? 
Uh, and then we're going to map that out. We're going to say, okay, maybe we will increase the bias or we can increase the weight proportion to A and we can change A. These are all the, you know, what we can do to, to affect this single neuron. So we're kind of going backwards. This is our second hidden layer um, and the things we need to alter here. Um, so now we take the desire of each of those neurons, so all 10 of those in the last layer, and we add that together for what should happen to the second to last layer um, in proportion to the corresponding weights and in proportion to how much each of those neurons need to change. Uh, so you're going to get this final list of changes that needs to happen, um, and you're recursively going to apply that same process to weights and biases that determine those values to the, you know, the first hidden layer now. So we're going to be working backwards. Um, so, you know, a true gradient descent step is really just averaging the desired changes for all of these training examples, so something like this. Um, but this is going to be computationally slow. And this average here, you know, this is proportional to the negative gradient of the cost function. Um, so true gradient descent is not actually used a whole lot either. Um, instead, you're going to see something called stochastic gradient descent. And we will cover this more in the optimization section. Um, but you can think of that as much faster to calculate. Um, it divides the training data into mini batches. Then it takes that mini batch. So instead of you know, 10,000, maybe a batch of like 128, it computes that gradient descent step. And then it uses the approximation instead of the actual gradient. Um, so that's you know, just a general overview here. Um, these screenshots are actually from a really amazing animated video from the website three blue one brown um, this is linked at the end if you ever want to like if you know understand some concept around math especially the math that makes up machine learning a lot of other things highly highly recommend the youtube videos um, very intuitive uh, and that's that's where a lot of this came from um, but that's just like a brief overview you know of deep learning um, and yeah this is a very busy slide um, this is actually a really interesting blog too um, also linked at the bottom that goes into all these different types of neural networks. Uh, we're only going to be talking about three, and we're really just going to be focusing on this one here, this deep convolutional network. Um, it's referred to as DCN here, can also be a convolutional neural network or CNN, um, just kind of wording. Um, but this sort of is a nice illustration. If you go to that blog, um, there's a little description of each and every one um, in case you're curious you know, what's out there. Um, so what we just went through was this multi-layer perceptron. Um, but as you can imagine, the number of parameters is rapidly going to become unmanageable. We had a very simple network. We we're already at 13,000. It's also going to react differently to shifted versions of an input. So say you have an image, that image would have to be in the same place each time. So it works okay on that number example because those are like in the center of this 28 by 28 pixel image, um, but it would not work when we go to generalize. Um, you're also losing spatial information. So you're not taking into account pixel position or correlation with neighbors. And that's where this convolutional neural network comes in. Um, most commonly used for pictures and videos, um, tasks such as identifications, you know, style transfer, enhancing images. Um, it really solves the problem of handcrafting features. And it works by assembling patterns of increasing complexity. So it's taking advantage of this sort of hierarchical pattern and data. Um, you know, after you pass, it, so you have like these small and simpler patterns, um, you're kind of building on this. So we'll, we'll discuss in detail what these layers do later on. But after you go through a convolutional layer, the image becomes abstracted to something called a feature map or an activation map. Um, so we're gonna, you know, feed our neural network with all these photos. And it's going to assign bigger weights to these combination of lines that it sees most frequently. Um, and then you might have a neural net that's sort of searching for the most distinctive features of an object all on its own. Um, so we'll dive into that a lot more you know, based on the project we're going to be working on. Um, there's also something you know, that's really popular out there called recurrent neural networks. Uh, this is really good for sequential data. So music or text used for speech recognition or voice synthesis. The idea here is that you add memory to each neuron. So, you know, not only are they getting info from this previous layer, um, but they also are getting this info from themselves in the previous pass. Um, and then the neuron, what's really important here is that the neuron can reset um, when that memory is no longer needed, so you don't end up with this insane amount of parameters, um, leaving that connection. 
Um, and that kind of gets into this like long and short-term memory, um, a lot of details there that uh, we don't cover in this tutorial. Um, but I can pause right now. Um, if there's questions, feel free to post them in the chat. We have Josh on sort of monitoring that. Otherwise, what we're gonna do is we're actually gonna get you set up um, with a sort of temporary account in Domino so that you can access cloud resources, so you can actually run code. Um, and then you'll we'll make sure you have the code later. Um, just note that this account won't stay up. But what I'm gonna do for right now is I am going to put this into the Zoom chat. Um, so if you navigate to this pycon.workshop.domino.tech, um, you're gonna be able to sign up. So don't try to log in. Um, you'll see a sign up button here. Use whatever email address and password you want. Um, just note that this is temporary, so you get to play around with it during the tutorial. Um, but this URL won't work after today, so it won't exist. Uh, and we're not gonna really get into like the details of what this is. Um, but it's really nice. It's just going to provide you access to a GPU machine with sort of one click of a button. The environment is all set up. Um, all the files are loaded, that sort of thing. So I'm going to give everyone a couple minutes to do that. Um, please let us know in the chat if you're having any issues signing up. Um, and we'll pause for questions. All right. And actually, if folks want to just kind of maybe drop in the chat um, once you do have an account. Uh, that'd be great. When you sign in, you'll sign up, then you'll log in, and you'll see a screen. Um, oh, thank you. Looks like we have some folks that are done. Uh, there we go. Uh, that will look. It'll look like this, but you're only going to see, you know, this quick start. So, um, but otherwise, this is what you're expecting to see, and you should see like whatever name you use down here in the bottom left. Um, it, it'll it'll look slightly different, but generally you just want to see a projects page. Um, awesome. So we've got at least a handful of folks done. Um, so we'll move on to the next part in just a second. Um, and then we'll probably make sure you get the project. Um, we're just going to be getting the project. We're not going to run code for like another little while. Um, so if you are having any issues, we're going to have a break before we start running code. So don't worry there, but it seems like everybody's good. So that's awesome. So the next part, this one's a little bit, um, a little bit trickier. So we want to make sure you get a copy of this project in your account. Um, so in this software, you do something called forking. And so actually, let me drop this into the chat. So we're going to go here. Um, and I can do this again, you can either just click that link as long as you're signed in. Um, you could go under popular projects, you could just search for deep learning tutorial, um, which is up here. So you could search. Um, if you're back here, if you go under popular projects, um, you'll see the deep learning. But just make sure you can navigate to that page. Um, so I'll give everyone a second to do that. Um, and check the Zoom chat for that link. So anyone who still needs the link, it's probably the easiest way. And then that'll bring you to this page. Um, so you should just see like some overview, has a bit of a summary, some resources, that kind of thing. Um, so once you're here, I'll show you how to kind of walk through this. Um, but what we're going to do is we're actually going to fork it. All right. Um, so to fork a project, um, it's a little hard to see, but in the top right of the overview page of this, and just again, make sure you're signed in. Sometimes it can be easy to like navigate here and not be signed in. And if that's the case, you'll get an error. Um, you're only going to see two buttons, um, but the one on the left is the one you want. So if you click it, it should pop up and say fork. So it's that sort of tuning fork style button. Give it any name you want. Um, you can use your name. You know, this is temporary. We're going to be providing like a repo later on with these resources that you'll just have access to. Um, but just give it a name and hit fork. And what will happen there is it will just bring you to that exact same overview page. Um, oh, apologies. <laughs> um, the welcome message is, I don't know if try, like resizing the window will work. Um, Hopefully that'll, that'll happen here, but hit fork. It should bring you to this. It'll take just a second to load, um, but then you'll have a copy of that. Um, so I'll give everyone a moment to try to get that into their account. Um, oh, awesome. Glad refresh worked. Yeah, if there's a, a message sort of blocking it, um, refresh is awesome. Cool. And then what you'll see next is essentially the same exact project. Um, but if you look at the URL, it's going to have your username and then whatever you name the project instead of the domino-andrea. 
Um, let us know if anyone's having issues. Um, otherwise, we'll move on to the next step um, in just a minute. And what we're going to do is we'll, um, I think, start workspaces, then we'll go through part of this tutorial and then take a short break so we can make sure everybody has, has these up. All right. Um, seems like no one's having issues. So the very next thing we want to do is we're going to start something called a workspace. Um, don't worry too much about this. Um, what we're doing here is we're just spinning up a virtual machine. Um, so you can select Jupyter, Jupyter Lab. Um, you don't have to do anything else, but hit the green button that says launch now, because um, we already have this hardware set up on GPU um, and we already have our environment set up. Um, so you don't need to click on anything else, um, just the green button here. Um, so go into Ju yeah, Jupyter Lab is the one you'll want. So just you could do it in Jupyter, Jupyter Lab, green button. What's going to happen is it's going to spin up in a new tab um, and it's going to take a little while. So don't worry. Um, you're just going to see it pop up a new tab and then you're going to see kind of like a spinning wheel. Um, these do take a few minutes. We're not going to use them for a while. So once you've hit that launch now, um, just leave that alone and we will come back to it in a bit. Um, and it may be quite a few minutes uh, before we're actually you know, live into the, the notebook itself. Um, any any questions, any issues before we start going through the slides? I um, just want to make sure everyone has this, so I'll show you one last time the whole process. Um, so forking this um, is going to be, there'll be two buttons. The one on the left, you'll enter your name and hit this blue button that says fork. Um, once you've done that, it'll just change the URL. You'll go to this workspaces tab here, um, and then yours will look a little different. Let me go to the, the blank one. So then you'll navigate into this workspaces tab. You'll hit Jupyter Lab and then the green launch now button. All right, and I think we'll go ahead and move on. Um, no, no timeout. And actually, um, as long as your pop up blocker is not, if you have a pop up blocker, you might just have to wait for it to load here, turn that off and reopen it. Um, so we can come back into that, um, but you will need to disable it for this. Um, but yeah, it should open that new tab. Um, and you'll see the spinning wheel for a while, so we're just going to leave that. So, so don't worry too much there. Oh, thanks, Jesse. Nice you had that. All right. Um, if you get stuck anywhere, just post in chat. Um, Josh is monitoring that. He can help you out too. Um, and next, we're going to get into a little bit of a PyTorch overview. Um, and then we're going to take a short break so that we can make sure everyone is set up and ready to go. So for deep learning in Python, there's a whole lot of different modules out there. Um, Keras is really popular, you know, TensorFlow, Dano, um, you know, you may have played around with some of these. Um, so feel free to explore those to read about them. Um, today we're going to be using PyTorch. And the reason we're using PyTorch is that it's easy to debug. So you can use this with many standard Python debugging tools. Um, it's really easy to distribute work amongst CPU or GPU cores. Um, there's a whole lot of built-in functions. Uh, so things like optimizers, transforms, really easy to build custom data loaders and transformers, very Pythonic, you know, creating custom classes is exactly what you'd expect. Um, there's also a really large community. And recently, um, PyTorch has been used in a lot of research papers and online courses. I think FastAI is, they build their own on top of PyTorch, um, but you're gonna see more and more of it. So we thought it was an interesting one to kind of start with as a tutorial. So a couple basics of PyTorch. Um, the very first one is something called tensors. So you're going to be working with tensors um, when you are using PyTorch. And this is a data structure that's really similar to arrays and matrices. So it's used to encode the input, um, something like pixel info, and then the output, which is going to be the classes. And it actually shares underlying memory with NumPy arrays but it can run on GPUs. Um, so you can do similar operations on both. And you can, there's a couple examples here. So we have our vector, we have our matrix, and then we have our tensor. Um, so if we have this color image, um, you know, we have a picture, we're gonna have um, these three channels, red, blue, and green. Um, so we're gonna end up with a tensor that has the width, the height, and then the info for all three of those channels. Um, the next sort of building block of PyTorch, something called data loaders and transforms. Uh, so first we'll talk about data loaders. 
uh, they let us pass samples in many batches. So when we were talking about stochastic gradient descent, we talked about sort of processing these in batches. Um, that's what the data loader does when you're working in PyTorch. Um, it can reshuffle the data at every epoch. Um, you can set that to true. That helps with generalization. It uh, helps speed up retrieval. Uh, you can set the number of workers using a data loader, so you can take full advantage of all the GPUs. So a lot of benefits to using this. Uh, and there's also something called transforms. So you're going to be kind of using both of these when you start out just getting your data into PyTorch. Um, so transforms modify you know, the data or the labels. Um, so fundamentally, um, they can help avoid overfitting. And they can also increase the number of training data if you need to for a CNN model. Uh, it doesn't always mean, so some people are like, oh, should I just apply all the transforms? Um, it's not always going to improve your accuracy. It could really depend on that input image. You know, maybe satellites will perform really differently from animals and then the model structure. Um, and there's a lot of different transforms. Um, we're going to get to play around with these in a little bit. That's things like cropping your image, maybe resizing it, making it grayscale, um, randomly flipping some of them in like the horizontal or vertical direction, uh, changing the per like the depth. Um, so this torchvision.transforms offers you know, several of these commonly used uh, transforms here. All right, so it is a little early for break. We we're going to do it about 45 minutes in, but I think this is a good time to start. Uh, Josh, I'll let you chime in maybe a 10 minute break. That way we can check on um, the workspaces for everybody, make sure they're up. Um, you can let us know if there's issues. And then we're going to actually get into working with the code when we come back. Um, so you're going to be able to just follow along if you want. Um, certainly, you can just watch this as a demo, um, but if you are uh, interested in actually running it yourself, you're able to do that. Um, so let's meet back, I believe in 10 minutes. I'll put this in the chat. And uh, in the meantime, you can just post in the general chat if you have an issue. Um, you can message myself or Josh directly. We can always go into a breakout room and debug anything, so don't hesitate to reach out. Um, and I will just put this, so let's do um, like an even 12 minutes. That way, you know, we can double check. So it'll be 50 past the hour. Um, oh, your Jupiter lab. Um, Jupiter should be fine. Um, someone asked that because these are Jupiter notebooks. And then the Jupiter lab, we'll check on that for you. Um, yeah, during the break, sometimes it can take a little bit of time. So, um, so let's meet back. At 12.50 Pacific time, you can convert that to whichever time zone you're in, or 50 past the hour. And, oh, and yeah, if it's assigning, um, no worries. That It just takes a couple minutes to spin up these machines. All right. I will see you all in about 10 minutes. And we will keep monitoring the chat.
All right. Um, I know we have a few people waiting in those workspaces. Um, so in the meantime, we're going to get you on some other machines. Um, while the GPU ones come up, um, we might be running into some limits. Um, so I'm going to let Josh post there. I'm going to give everyone a second. Um, if you have one up and running, um, you're good to go. Uh, it should look something like this. Um, if you don't, no worries. We have a lot of extra just sort of, we can get you on a normal machine. So let me come back into my deep learning tutorial. Um, so what you want to do is if it's still in that like spinning phase, just come back into workspaces um, at the top. Um, oh, and I have two here. So let me shut one down. Um, or let me just show you how to do that from another one. Um, so you're going to have one that shows in workspaces here, um, but just say create new workspaces. Um, you select Jupyter Lab, and then under hardware tier, just switch that to large um, from GPU. So come back. You're just going to create a second one. So you're going to have two. Um, if it's running, you don't need to do this. So this is only if um, it's still in the signing. Just switch that to large. Hit launch now, um, and you'll see this. This one will move through a lot faster, um, just because it's not that GPU machine. So I'll give everyone a second to go with that. Um, and then the first notebook is just kind of like a review of data cleaning. Um, so there's no real activity there. I'm just going to walk you through it. We wanted to make sure that you do have all the info um, if you want to reproduce this later. Um, but we're not going to spend any time kind of like downloading data, doing some of the cleaning, none of that. Um, but I do want to make sure you know where you can access that. Um, so yeah, just let me know if anyone was gone, they missed that. Um, if you are in a signing, we'll also put this in the chat in a moment. Um, you're just going to create a second workspace by going to create new workspace and switching that hardware tier before. So let's change it to large and then hit launch now. All right. And then this is what we have. Um, so we are gonna move into like our first sort of demo. So right now you're not following along, I'm just kind of watching this one. Um, I'm gonna kind of give you an overview of where all these files are. Um, so you're gonna see a lot happening here. Um, we're gonna be just working within these five notebooks. Um, we've already downloaded the data. Um, so this is from a really large data set. So I'm going to give you a little overview of the project. Um, we get into prep data. Um, but that's all into this data folder. Here we have, um, I believe it is 16,000 images out of like millions. Um, and it's really easy to download um, the larger data set if you're interested. Just make sure you have space. It can take a little while. Um, but that's what we're going to be working with today. So you're not going to need to download anything. Um, but we do have the supplement here. Um, so this Python notebook is going to walk you through all the code um, needed to download this from um, this library here. So I'm going to open that up. Um, what we're doing today is we're going to be playing around with images from Snapshot Serengeti. So there, this whole data set is like 2.6 million images. And these come from camera traps. So this is just capturing movement out in the Serengeti. Um, and then they have uh, volunteers come in and they label these images. Um, and they say, hey, what species is here? They have a lot of different questions. You know, is, are they sitting? Are they standing? Um, are there multiple species? That kind of thing. Um, but what we're going to focus on is images with just one animal in them and identifying those species. Um, there's a really neat paper that's also linked in the overview where they were able to do this in sort of two phases. The first um, differentiated blank images from those with animals. Um, because this data set, I think, is about three quarters um, just blank images, so just background. Um, and once they did that, then they had their algorithm work to um, differentiate the type of animal. And I think it was pretty accurate and it can save, you know, thousands of hours of labeling these. Um, and you can read a little bit more about, you know, why this is important for conservation, restoration, that kind of thing here. Um, but we wanted to recreate just a little bit of that paper. Um, and we're doing it in PyTorch. Um, they did it in, I think, Keras, I believe. Um, so this is just an overview of the data. Um, you can see these are huge files. So you don't want to necessarily just download them to your computer. Uh, so what we did is we pulled the metadata. And then um, we actually, there's a, a better way to use AZ Copy. Um, I think they're storing this in Azure to get this into wherever you wanted it. So we put it into the cloud here. You could put it on your laptop or somewhere else. Um, so this is that website. Um, it's all linked here. Um, and then these are the two metadata files. Oh, and Julia, yeah, I think um, Josh is probably going to post um, some info. He might be reaching out to you on chat, getting you all set up um, in just the large hardware tier um, if you're stuck with that GPU one. Um, but if you are, 
uh, just message him and he'll kind of walk you through those instructions. All right, um, so this is just having you read in these files so we can see we have an annotations file that gives us things like the capture ID, the subject ID, um, the species. Um, there are labels for humans um, and note that actually the large data set um, they do not post anything with a label of human for privacy concerns. So you will have those in the annotations file, but you would not be able to get those, though I think you can reach out to them um, separately if you want. Um, and then they answer all these questions about, um, you know, what's the max number of animals? Are they eating, moving, that sort of thing? Um, you can see all the columns here. Uh, for our purposes, we took out anything with a label of human or blank. Um, we looked at the species. Initially, there's 74. Um, though there's some, you know, duplicates, you want to make sure to check for things like capitalization. Um, so once we clean this up a little bit, we end up with 61, uh, just because you can see here, like gazelle grants um, is shown twice because this is capitalized and you don't want to have like those split classes. Uh, the next we did is we um, limited it to those with just one animal. So that's going to be this question count max. Um, and then we also looked at this P users identified the species. Um, we just wanted to have a high number for this, so it was likely that this was actually accurate. Um, I think there was a lot of misidentification in certain images um, that we found when reading through the paper. Um, after that, we can see, you know, the most common species, zebras, gazelles, giraffes, elephants, wildebeest, um, and we have a lot of images for those groups. Uh, however, for bats, which makes sense, uh, things like that, there's not really a whole lot to work with, and we don't want to keep those with like one or five images. Um, so here we're bringing in now this, which is just a list of the path, and this is how you download them. Um, and then we are going to merge you know, the ones that we want to keep. So we're combining that. We have the path here, um, printing this out so we can look at the number of species. Um, and then we're just pulling a set number from each class. So this is what we initially did. Um, we made sure that the classes had at least 500 images. So all of those really small ones were eliminated. Um, and we decided to, we played around with different numbers offline um, when we had a lot more time and had a lot of space to store really large data. Um, but we didn't want you to have to sit through, you know, an hour of training in this. So we decided to limit it. We still got pretty good accuracy. Um, we actually cut this down even further. Um, but within that data file, you're going to find this, you know, thousand images for each of those species. Um, and that would leave you with 28 here. Uh, again, this is just kind of printing them out. You can see you know, we have some that just barely met that minimum, um, like porcupine or jackal. Um, we also had to check for corrupt images, um, things that didn't download properly. We did this on a larger data set, um, but I made sure to link the notebook as well. So you can just see that in this check corrupt images in that folder. Um, once you've downloaded stuff, you can kind of loop through. Um, that was done before also to save time. Um, and then lastly, we decided to limit the number of classes, again, just to speed things up. Um, but if you want to play around with this later, feel free to come back to this section. Um, you can choose, you know, the classes that you find interesting. You can just go with all of them. And um, we did actually, you know, train it on the like 28 classes or 21 classes that we had, um, and it worked pretty well. Um, but it does take a little while. Uh, so that's the code for prepping data. Um, you can see that we went through that. And then if I come back to this download data, um, we have this prepped. Um, and I have all the info here on downloading it. Because uh, again, you don't want to necessarily download the like terabyte of data from the website. Uh, so you can actually give it a list of images. You can do kind of all that data cleaning, filter out what you want. Um, you could save that in any, you just need to save it in a text file. And then you can run this in a terminal. So they're using something called AZ copy, just to bring it back into whatever folder. You tell it, hey, I want to save it to an images or to a data folder, pass it a list of images, and then give it that. Um, and it does bring them back into all these subdirectories. If you want to flatten that, this is just a bash script. So they're all in one big folder because the subdirectories aren't super meaningful. They have to do with the season, the capture ID, that kind of thing. Um, and then this kind of walks you through what we did here. Oh, yeah. Yeah, where was that download data um, notebook? Oh, yes, great question. So the download data one is all in this download data supplement. Um, so yeah, that one, we're not going to use it all today. We're not going to run, um, but this is just for reproducibility sake. So you'll see also I left um, just some lists. Like when we checked for corruption, we have labels here. Um, we had pulled like a random set of 25%, which is around 380 gigs. So if you didn't want to do the cleaning, you just wanted to use that. This is a list of names. Um, and then we have the text files with some of those also 
just reduce data sets so you could pull those in. Um, and the workspace too, if you're clicking around, just want to point out in case you're not super familiar, if you're in Jupyter, which I am, um, a lot of you are probably in Jupyter Lab, um, but if, if you need to get back to the main directory, you can select here, um, everything's going to be in this MNT directory. Um, and you can use either if you haven't started it up, um, go with Jupyter Lab or what you're most comfortable with. Um, and if you're in Jupyter Lab, you'll see, you'll see that sidebar with kind of the file structure and you'll select one prep data. Um, from here, you can just click into it uh, and that's gonna show you the code. Um, again, you don't need to run this. It's actually not gonna save back because we didn't wanna overwrite those files we created, um, but it just kind of walks you through the steps we took. Um, any, yeah, I agree. Use Jupyter Lab, it's a little bit easier. <laughs> I just defaulted to Jupyter. Um, I've, I've used it for so long. Um, any questions on the data set um, or where to find info? Um, so this is where, you know, Jupyter Lab, you could pull this up. Um, so this is my CPU question. So we would just kind of look through prep data. You're not going to run it. Um, and as a reminder, and the project itself, um, when we go to the GitHub repo, you're going to have an overview page. And that links to this main data set, um, to the article that did the like initial analysis. Um, and then they have some GitHub code for the analysis that they use. They tested out a bunch of different models. Um, they had multiple phases, pretty interesting stuff. So, and then it kind of tells you what is in the project itself. All right, um, let me know if there's questions. Otherwise, we're gonna start talking about loading data into PyTorch. Uh, and so I will do that here. I'm gonna go ahead and close this one. Um, so we're not gonna go through too many of these imports um, as you work through you know, PyTorch, you'll come across what you need. Um, but we're going to set up things like the image directory, the annotations file. This one, we have our reduced classes. Um, and then we're going to create a labels file, um, shuffle this data set just to make it interesting, and then um, print out what we're working with. So we limited it to four species. So we have 4,000 rows right now. Um, and all we have is the an image name and then the species. And when we run things like data loader, it's going to reference the image name and that directory to process it. Um, and it's gonna map the label to that image. Uh, the next thing we're gonna do is just create a dictionary for the species. Um, so we, we will get into one hot encoding later. Um, right now we're just encoding these so that we can do some like basic image processing. Um, and now we're getting into the PyTorch stuff. Um, so PyTorch provides two data primitives. Uh, you have something called data loader, which we talked about before. It lets you pass those samples in many batches. Um, and then data set. So data set is what stores you know, the samples, their corresponding labels. And then data loader is wrapping that iterable around data set. Um, so what we're gonna do is we're actually going to create a custom data set class um, and inherit from this predefined data set. Um, so we have these three methods. Um, we need to get you know, the length so that we can see the size of the data set. Um, we're gonna use something called get item. And here, you know, we're going to pull in, we're going to read in these images. Um, we're going to say, hey, if we're applying transforms, make sure to apply those to the images or to the, you know, the targets, which would be the labels. Um, and then uh, that's essentially what we're doing here. It's just kind of loading in the data because right now it's all in just one big folder. Um, so I'm going to run that cell. Feel free to follow along. Um, you know, you can use, if you're not familiar with Jupyter Lab, no worries. You can run cells by hitting this arrow button or you can use like shift enter that'll run and move you down into the next cell. Um, so we just ran that first you know, data set cell here. Um, the next one is gonna display a sample of these photos without transforms. So we're just gonna pull in three of them. We can get an idea of what these trap images actually look like. Um, and keep in mind, you know, they're just out there. I don't think they're super high quality cameras um, and they're taking images all the time. So you might not have great resolution um, or contrast. You may have like an animal really up close um, or just a part of an animal, as you can see, or something at night. Um, so these aren't like perfectly centered pictures, um, which is important to keep in mind. Um, so we now have our data, you know, we've loaded this, we have it all ready to go. The next thing we wanna do is start working with transforms. Um, one, because these have to be processed in order to be used with the network that we're gonna be, you know, building in the next notebook. Um, and then you also, like I mentioned, you wanna make sure to do some of this to avoid overfitting to help generalize. Um, so this is a standard transform here. Um, we're resizing this. We're converting it to a tensor. 
and then we're normalizing this. And these numbers were chosen um, because of the way PyTorch um, brings in pre-trained networks, um, and you'll see that in another slide. Uh, so we can run that. Um, so we're setting up the standard transform. Um, we're just applying that here. We have our data loader with 16 images and then a function um, to plot a sample of these. So it's gonna plot nine of them after we've applied the transforms. Um, so what we can do here is we can say, okay, we have the images with transforms. Um, what do these look like? Again, we're just normalizing and resizing. We'd expect them to look you know, essentially the same um, because it's a standard transform. That would be something that we would want to keep on the validation set. Um, but for our train set, this is where we want to add in, you know, maybe a few of these different PyTorch transforms. Um, there's a whole bunch built in that you can use right out of the box. Um, so there's a link here. I did not mean to do that. <laughs> um, uh, I just accidentally cut that. Um, but that'll take you to this uh, PyTorch doc. Um, but these are a sample of ones you may want to test out. Um, but if you go to the docs, it'll tell you what parameters um, although you can always try something, uh, you can always do like shift tab if you're not sure, and it'll tell you what you have to pass it. So for rotation, you have to give it the degrees that you wanted rotated. Um, if we wanted to do something like t dot, uh, we just do t dot grayscale. Um, you could also just, if you put a cursor in there and you hit shift tab, it'll usually show you um, if there's something you need. Uh, all right. um, and things like, you know, cropping or maybe this horizontal flip um, could be interesting. So what we're going to do is actually have you play around with these. Um, so let me show you here. So, yeah, for example, if we put in this horizontal flip, um, you don't actually have to pass it anything, but you can. Um, so if I was to run this, you know, I'm flipping it and I'm rotating it by 30 degrees. Um, this is just going to take a second. It's going to apply those to nine images. And now I can see what this looks like and what I'd be passing to my model. Uh, so when you go to add these and play around with them, we're gonna put you in some breakout rooms just so you can test it out and kind of talk about transforms and, and what you'd expect to work here. Um, your code's gonna look like this. So any of these that you wanna try, just make sure you proceed it by like this capital T dot. Um, that's just how the module was imported. Um, and make sure you don't forget like the comma at the end um, but try it one at a time. You can try it a few at a time um, and just sort of run that cell. Um, you can try it, you know, run it, go back, change the transforms, run it again. Um, feel free to copy it. Um, and just note, yeah, we're using something called Compose to combine those all so that we're applying them to the image one by one. Any questions on this? All right, um, so let's... Uh, let me know if you're, I think, I yeah, think Josh, I know you're, you're kind of responding to everyone. Um, let me know if you have any issues getting into this notebook, you know, feel free to use Jupyter or Jupyter Lab. Um, just make sure you run all the cells ahead of time. Um, and I think we can go ahead and do like five minutes in a breakout room. Um, we'll visit and just kind of talk about some of the transforms, but I want to give you some time to play around with PyTorch itself and come up with any questions. Andre, do you want me to uh, load up the breakout rooms right now or? Yeah, and let's just do um, like, you know, five or so, four okay. or five, whatever is easier for you. Yeah, that'd be great, thanks. Mm -hmm. um, and just keep us, yeah, feel free to post in the chat if you have any issues. And we'll probably bring everyone back around in like five minutes um, would be great. Okay. Yeah, thanks.
All right, I think we're going to have everyone back in in a few seconds. Um, oh, sorry, I just saw. Uh, yeah, I know the breakout rooms. Um, so yeah, I hopefully you got a chance to just see some of the, the different transforms that are available to you. Um, we can come up here and kind of think about what would make sense um, for something like this. You know, if you're going to be rotating, you may want to pad the image. Um, you know, these are, you know, for animals, you probably want a little bit more um, because especially like a data set like this, um, we already have, you know, pretty big difference in where they're located, that kind of thing. Um, but wanted to make sure you got a feel for these. It can be really helpful to like test some transforms, run the model. Um, these can have a really big effect as well. Um, they can also cost you a lot of time. So when we get into the optimization um, portion, um, which is a pretty long notebook, we'll talk about speeding things up. All right, um, next we're gonna get into deep learning and practice. Um, but before we do so, um, those of you that are on CPU machines, we're just gonna have you stop them um, and restart it because we wanna get you on um, one that has like threaded memory. So we set that up um, during the breakout room. So what you can do is if you just kind of hover over this bar, if you hit settings, um, if this says large, um, we're gonna stop and just hit restart. If it says GPU, that's okay, just leave it. Um, you don't need to change anything. But all you have to do is just hit the stop button um, say stop. Um, this will shut down, so you'll see it kind of slowly um, pause. Um, all your work's going to be there. You don't have to do anything, all the changes you made. Um, you're just going to exit that tab. You're going to go back into this workspaces tab, and you're going to see, okay, this has stopped. Um, just hit restart. Um, so we're just kind of restarting that before we get into building the model and using like a whole lot of memory. Um, so that's how you'll do that. So let me know if there's any questions. Um, again, just hit stop at the, the top. Just click back into the tab with the project um, and hit start on like the big workspace button. Um, but you really only need to do that if you hover here under settings. If it says GPU, you're good. But if it says large, go ahead and restart. Sorry, we had to split you up onto different machines, um, but you'll get to see how it works kind of on both, I guess. So we'll be playing around with that when we get into the model. Um, you'll be able to kind of compare uh, the two. Um, let me know if there's any questions, any interesting things you came across um, when checking out the transforms. Uh, before we move into the next section. If the GPU node is not coming up, should we stop it? Um, you can leave that or you can stop it, um, but you'll just want to make sure you're on a workspace with the large tier um, and everything will still run, so you'll be good. Um, and actually, it can be interesting to see. We have all the code set up so that it knows, hey, should I be using GPU or CPU, um, which is really good practice if you're ever working in, in the cloud. So we'll get into some of that. But yeah, if that's running, um, don't worry there. Uh, we'll let you know if you want to restart it, but just for the large ones. And so, and actually everyone could, if you want to compare the two, if you do have a GP one up, GPU one up, um, you can leave that and you can always just create another one. So you can have two, you can have one that's GPU, and then you can have one on this large tier and you would just hit launch now. Um, and then you could go back and forth. And if your GPU one isn't working, no worries there. Um, sometimes that happens with cloud, they kind of throttle you occasionally. Uh, so we are working with them to get that set up. But all right, um, anything else before we move into this section? All right, so now we're going to be talking about deep learning and practice. We're going to do a little bit of a deeper dive, kind of some theoretical stuff, but we do want to spend a lot of time on the code and the practical part and like those things that can really speed up your training time. Um, so we know that we're going to be building out the CNN architecture in PyTorch. And we're going to have an input layer and an output layer. Um, the input layer being the features. Um, we have, in this case, color images. We have a width, a height, and we have these three color channels. And then the output layer being the data set labels. So that'll be the number of species we're looking at. Um, when we limit it to four, um, we'll, we'll get sort of four outputs. But if we had more, that would change. Um, and you can see for convolutional networks, there's these layers in between. Uh, so the first one I'm going to mention is something called a convolutional layer. Uh, what happens here is you have this filter, and you can kind of see, and that scans across the input, and it calculates a value. So it uses this convolution operation. So we have you know, this little filter is producing this, right here is producing this value here. Um, each filter can be related to anything. So for example, one could locate tails, maybe you're doing facial recognition, one looks for noses. Uh, there's gonna be multiple filters and that's gonna result in a 3D output. Uh, so we have that 3D output 
but each 2D slice of the filters is something called a kernel. Um, and then one thing to note, you know, you, you're like, hey, what if I have two filters that are the same? Um, that's very unlikely unless the number of chosen filters is like extremely large. Um, so we have these kernels um, that you can see here. We have our filter, we have our destination pixel. So we have a feature map for each of those kernels, each 2D slice of the filter. And these are going to be passed through an activation function. And that's going to determine, hey, is this feature present at the location or not? So it's basically what we're like trying to identify is just these different features that the network has deemed important. Um, and this is kind of another way to think about it. So we have this color image here, um, three channels. We have four filters. Um, and these are cubes because they're applied on the full depth of the image. So red, blue, and green. Um, and we end up with this sort of overall um, output here. So we have our kernels, which are learned. They make up filters. You have one bias for filter. Um, these are you know, initially applied to the original image, um, but then you can have multiple of these. So you could actually have a feature map that's generated and then a convolutional layer that's applied to that again. And you'll see when you print out the architecture for some of these, um, it does go from you know, one convolutional layer to a pooling layer to another convolutional layer and so on. Um, and like just to summarize again, that activation function is used on every value of the feature map. Cool. So some activation functions that you can see here. Um, ReLU is pretty much the one most people are going to be using. Great start. It's cheap. It's stable. You know, we need to add this nonlinearity. Um, so we're going to pick one of these. The only time you can have issues with ReLU is if the weights um, lead to negative inputs into a neuron. Um, that neuron can't effectively contribute. So that could be no, that's known as dying ReLU. Um, so there is something called leaky ReLU that addresses that. We're not going to get into it in this talk, um, but generally this is the, the most used one. And to kind of address the nonlinearity again, um, you, you need to make sure you're adding this to network. Otherwise, it's essentially just a linear regression model. Um, this is what makes it capable of learning and performing more complex tasks. All right, um, another activation function um, that you're going to see at the end is something called softmax. So this is used for building a multi-class um, classifier. Uh, so this is you know, different from a sigmoid um, because it ensures the sum of the outputs along that final channel is one. Um, because remember, we're looking at probabilities, and we need those to, to add up to one, um, whereas a sigmoid would just make each output between 0 and 1. Um, so we have our you know, activation function that's going to go into the hidden layers, and then right before our final one, we'll have this softmax. Um, we also have something called a pooling layer. Uh, so this is typically applied after a convolution layer. Um, it reduces dimensionality. And there's two different types. Uh, the most common is going to be this max pooling. And this selects the largest value on that feature map. So we're looking for these outliers, because that's if the network sees the feature. And then it passes that largest value along. Um, but there's also average pooling that you may use in, in certain um, cases here. Uh, kind of similar to convolutional layers, but just perform a specific function. Um, but again, you can see we have you know, this um, filter kind of here. We're looking for the max, and then we're pulling that out. Um, so we're getting much smaller dimensions. Um, and lastly, you're going to have some fully connected layers. Um, so this is where each input is connected to all the neurons. Um, it's used near the end of CNN architectures uh, to determine labels from those features. So we're essentially aggregating the input from that final feature map. So here, you know, we have a convolution layer plus our activation function. Um, we do some pooling, we go on, um, then we have this fully connected layer and then the output. Um, oh yeah, so max pooling is, is pretty much used whenever you have a CNN. Um, we had a good question in chat. Uh, I'll see if we post a couple in a minute. And um, that's what we're using here. And I think a lot of times when you are just doing this sort of object um, identification, you're going to see that. So those are the layers of CNN. Um, that's the network we're going to be using next. And to build these in PyTorch, you're going to use something called torch.nn. That's the basic building block for graphs. Uh, there's a whole bunch of functions for these convolutional layers. Uh, and you can put in all sorts of parameters that we'll get into later when we talk about hyperparameters, um, pooling, many other types, all these nonlinear activations. This is where you're going to find loss functions. Uh, and a couple of these are important. Um, one, you have this module. So this is how you kind of build out your network. Um, so you'll see that we'll like write a class there. And then you may want all these layers. So you're going to build these in a sequential 
container using this nn dot sequential. Um, but that'll make more sense when we start going through the code. Um, so when you get into PyTorch, if you ever do one of those tutorials, um, you'll come to a section called Autograph. And what this really means is uh, it's kind of like an automatic differentiation system. So we know that back propagation is used to calculate the gradient of a weight. Um, so for each iteration, we have several gradients. Um, these are calculated as we go through. And something called a computational graph is built. So we have to store all of those. So PyTorch does it by building this dynamic computational graph. Um, and that's just, you know, Autograd is what they use um, essentially to do this. So um, you'll see when we start like going through the code, I think Josh will explain when we type in like backward, how it's doing the backward propagation, where in the training loop we're adding that, that sort of thing. So we've talked about layers. Um, if we were to go and just build one of these CNNs, we would need a lot of images to train and it would take a really long time. And so it's really common to use something called transfer learning, where you're taking a pre-trained network um, and then you're using this to, you know, you're taking some of the knowledge there and transferring it for your task. So for images, um, there's a lot of these large networks that were trained on something called ImageNet. Um, this is like an open source image database. And these are going to contain information in these final convolutional layers or these like early fully connected layers about how an image is composed and then a combination of edges and shapes. Um, so that ImageNet uh, is going to produce, there's a lot of different papers out there. I'll show you in the next slide um, how you can use this. Uh, but there's really two ways. One, you could say, okay, I want this to be a feature extractor. So you have all of these layers. They have all of these weights already determined. You can just freeze them all. And all you're using is this last fully connected layer. Um, so you're keeping the features, but then you're changing the classifier to match you know, the number of classes that you have. Uh, you could also fine tune one of these. So it, it would be training, but you would use a really small learning rate to ensure that it's not unlearning previous knowledge. And we'll dive into learning rate a little bit later as well. So transfer learning in PyTorch. Um, so if you go to torchvision.models, this has all of these different image classification models, all these different architectures. They link to the papers that developed them. And so you can click through when you have these slides to this link, um, and it's going to describe all of those. And each of them has an option for pre-trained equals true. Uh, and that's going to download the weights um, so that you could freeze those layers and use it as a feature extractor. Um, keep in mind that these pre-trained models expect input images in a certain format. Um, so you saw before in our transforms we were normalizing. Um, we have these numbers specifically from this page and because we know that's what it's expecting. Um, same with the size of these images. They do have to be of a certain size. Uh, there's also some interesting articles out there. I linked one. Um, reproducibility between these packages, actually, in these pre-trained models, isn't always possible because I think Keras, one of them brings in the weight specifically from that paper. Whereas I think PyTorch, their developers um, try to reproduce the paper. So uh, it kind of goes through just stuff to think about um, if you're using these, it's, it's pretty interesting. Um, and then here, if you wanted to see some information on like, which seemed to be more accurate, this was a, an interesting project where he kind of ranked them on his own data set. Um, there's also a blog here uh, that was kind of fun. So what they did is they had their own data that they were looking at and they compared all of these different pre-trained models. It's a little hard to see, so don't worry about that. Uh, but essentially they have this X coordinate. Um, so that's top one error. So you just lower is better. Um, and then this Y coordinate is inference time. So this is on a GPU in milliseconds. Again, lower is better. So we kind of want anything close to this origin. And then the bubbles, um, they represent model size. Um, and this is just for their data. So don't like try to transfer this to yours, uh, but it's just fun to see how somebody compared them on their own and for what they were doing. Um, and they found this RE50, which is that ResNet 50, um, which you can see here um, in terms of what they were looking for was the best one. And that's actually what we're using, um, but it's also based on the paper we referenced. They tested out a few different models. Um, you might do the same, um, but there's a lot of like kind of resources out there so you can think about how does my image data set compare to those, to ImageNet, all of that. Um, but yeah, you're not necessarily just going to pick like 
this one always. There's a lot of reasons to use other, other models here. Cool, so you're training a model. Um, if you're trying to train it on your laptop, um, for what we're using today, if you're using pre-trained models and like a small number of images, that's gonna be fine. Um, but you're not gonna be able to do this when you, you start to get into bigger models. Um, you're gonna wanna use something called GPU. And that just lets you perform these multiple simultaneous um, computations that enable the distribution of training processes. So GPU really just has a large number of really simple cores, whereas CPU has just a few complicated cores. And that's how they differ here. Um, you know, GPUs are really great for deep learning. They have accelerated the field um, rapidly uh, since they became you know, cheaper and more widely used. Uh, they can have um, a bandwidth sort of bottleneck issue. So transferring large amounts of data to the GPU can be really slow. Um, and that's, you know, we talk a little bit about that in one of the notebooks later on. Um, lastly, we kind of went through this before, um, but before we really get into building a model, you know, this is a machine learning review, um, but make sure you're cleaning your data, you're exploring it, you know, corrupt images will break things. Um, we actually had that happen. Uh, things weren't working and we realized it's because some of the images were corrupted. Um, you know, imbalanced classes, you really need to watch out for. Um, you're always going to want a train and validation set or a train test and validation set. And you want to make sure that you're distributing classes evenly in both sets. Uh, so use something called stratification for that. Don't apply test or don't apply like these different transforms on like cropping and rotating stuff to your test set because you know you want to make sure it just works on the images as they are. Um, that's why we're going to reduce all these differences in the training set to generalize, but then you want your test set to be um, in a format that the model can handle, but not like you know cropped and rotated. Uh, and then lastly, you, you need to encode your categorical variables. Uh, a few different ways to do that. Um, you're going to see us use one hot encoding, um, but certainly there's others. All right, so that's our review. We've talked about these layers. We've talked about this architecture. Uh, there's a couple other things that you need to think about. Um, and one is going to be what loss function do you use? So the loss function, you know, that's the error essentially for a single training example. Um, you know, the cost function is kind of over the entire training set or that mini batch. Um, you can kind of think of them a little bit more synonymous, though you know, your cost function can contain regularization terms. Um, but for loss functions, you know, if you're doing regression, um, there's more than this, but these are a couple popular ones. Mean squared error loss, mean absolute error loss, binary classification. Um, you have that, you know, binary cross entropy and hinge loss. And then for what we're doing, multi-classification, Cross entropy. Um, there's also the Kullback Lieber divergence. I think that's maybe used, it's a little bit newer in like its widespread use. Um, and I'll talk about the two of those real quick. Um, so we won't dive into the other types of models. The cross entropy, sorry, cross entropy is a default loss function. Uh, it calculates a score that summarizes the average difference between the actual and predicted probability distributions. So the score is minimized. Um, a perfect value would be zero. Uh, in general, this could change, but like one's probably not super great, two, maybe something's broken. Um, and then note, we're actually going to use something a little bit different um, because we have one hot encoding, but it's essentially a lot like cross entropy, um, but we don't have to then add in code to like change our outputs. So that's cross entropy. Um, we're not using this one, but just wanted to mention it since it's somewhat popular. Uh, this is also called relative entropy. So this is another form of distancing. So really, again, just the difference between two probability distributions. So you know, as your optimizer adapts its weights, those predictions change. And so does the probability distribution generated by your model you know, for the, the classes. Um, so then you can measure the loss of information between that um, and then the actual training data set to do some optimization. Um, so you're really just saying, okay, what's lost when I change this? So those are two loss functions, um, just something to think about. And now we're gonna move into our next activity. Um, so I think we're gonna switch over. Josh is gonna, Josh is gonna kind of walk you through the next few notebooks. Um, I'll move into this one and I can stop sharing if that works best for you. Sure. Um, so what we're going to do now is we're going to actually go back into uh, that workspace that we that we had started before, uh, and we're going to walk through a couple notebooks. So let me share my screen.
Is everybody able to see uh, this screen that I'm sharing now? Yep. Okay. So the, the first one that we're gonna look at is uh, this notebook number three, which is about building the model. Um, so what we're doing here is we're really talking through kind of the basic components. Some of you uh, may have, you know, varying amounts of familiarity with PyTorch. Uh, so what we really wanna talk about as a, a big takeaway of this training, right, is uh, what are the components of a model that you can build in PyTorch? And then we're gonna talk through kind of how to make those work well and how to diagnose some kind of common issues that you might run into. Uh, so the first thing you can run these cells along with me or you can uh, just kind of treat this as a demo, either one is fine. Uh, so in the start, right, we're just gonna import a bunch of different uh, packages. You can, you can look through these, but most of these are the standard packages you'd use uh, and some other modules inside of PyTorch. So we already have um, this annotations file. So we have both uh, image labels, which links to all of the images. We're here actually gonna use this uh, labels reduce classes CSV. Um, and what that is gonna do is we have now the directory where our images are stored. Uh, that's under data. And this has been loaded with that script that Andrea talked about earlier. Uh, and we have a cleaned up file that has a CSV of all the labels uh, and the links to uh, the image that that label is associated with. Um, in here, we're preparing kind of a dictionary, right, of the species that we have, all the, all the unique labels basically in this file. Uh, and we're also building a dictionary both of species to an index and from an index back to a species so we can use those later for reference. Um, and now in that file, there are a thousand of each of those four species. Uh, we're actually just gonna, to help speed this along a little bit, we're gonna reduce those down to just 200 samples of each species. Uh, so that's what this cell is doing. You could see we have for, you know, zebra giraffe and the other ones uh, that there's just 200 of each. Uh, and then we can actually run uh, the following code, right? Even just to, to confirm kind of the counts of the classes and also to show us uh, the dictionary that we have mapping each of those species uh, to, to an index. So in uh, PyTorch, PyTorch has a lot of abstractions that kind of help you manage some of the the standard things that you need to do in the standard operations as part of building and training a model. Uh, and kind of the core one of those is a data set. So PyTorch has built in data sets, but a lot of the time you're gonna to wanna to use your own data. Um, and to define your own data set in PyTorch, you really need to do three things. So first you build this class uh, that inherits from the standard data set class in PyTorch. Uh, and this is a class that you know you build yourself, and all that class has to have is these three specific methods. It has to have uh, an initialization method, and this kind of sets up all the variables and ingests all the data for like what the directory of where your images are going to be, uh, the file with all the labels, or anything else that you may have for your specific use case. Um, it needs to have a length method uh, so that when data set, which gets called uh, at varying places in PyTorch, uh, will return the size of the data set. And it needs a get item method, which when you call a data set with an index, uh, is going to return that index uh, sample for the data set. So this allows you to actually, um, you know, pull different images into your model to train or put into batches, um, but not have to actually think about interacting with the images when you're like training your model. That's all going to be abstracted away by what you put inside your data set. So here we have now a bunch of different uh, transforms. So you can see one thing that gets fed into our custom data set uh, is both the, the transform of the actual image and the target transform of the actual uh, index. So for the first transform here, depending on if this is gonna be the data set we're using for training or for validating, uh, we have these two different transforms here. Uh, you'll notice that the, the train one is going to be pretty similar probably to what you had in notebook two. And if you came up with any uh, fun additional transforms, right, that you wanted to put in here to augment your data, uh, you can feel free to, to come back and add those in and, and kind of see what effect that has on the model. Um, and then in the validation transform, uh, we are actually, all we're doing is kind of resizing and cropping out the center of the image. We're not going to do any of the rotations and flip transforms because we want to validate against the actual data that we have. 
um, in this target transform, we're taking the index of, uh, and you can see here kind of the index of what that label is. And we're basically just one hot encoding it. Uh, so here we have uh, four species, right? So if it's the first species um, is the label for this, you're going to get a, a four element uh, vector, where if it's the first species, right, that the, the first element is going to be a one, everything else is going to be a zero, and so on, depending uh, what the value of your actual label is. Uh, so now we, we kind of have some of the, the high level structures that we want set up. We're going to actually now generate uh, our train and validation sets. And here we're going to use um, actually a function just from scikit-learn, uh, which we imported earlier on, and that's the train test split. Uh, we're not going to get into this too much, but the main reason I wanted to do it this way instead of doing it from scratch uh, was to point out that even if you're using a new tool, like you're using PyTorch, uh, or if you're used to using PyTorch, but you're going to use TensorFlow or something like that, um, you can always go back to specific modules of tools that you're familiar with and use those to kind of help you prep data uh, in a way that's going to like kind of ease the learning curve, right? For you to get into a new tool and, and actually get worth it. Um, so this is this function is just a, a pretty basic wrapper around that scikit-learn command. Um, and what this is going to do here is we pick the portion of our um, of our samples that are going to go into our validation set. Here we're doing just 10%. Um, and then this will show us right how many in our train data set and our validation data set we have um, of each of these classes. And you can see that they've been uh, stratified and split evenly. And the reason you want to do that, right, is you you want to uh, minimize the chance that you end up with your validation set um, just including like 80 pictures of zebras, right? And then you're just all you're checking is how well your model is fitting pictures of zebras, and you're kind of ignoring how well it does on giraffes or wildebeest. Um, so now that we have these, we can actually generate an instance of the data set for each. So all we have uh, generated here is the actual uh, train of validation indices. Um, but by feeding here, we're, we're actually uh, doing kind of two things to generate these data sets. So the only difference between the data sets is actually the transform that the data set is using. Remember that we had both that train and validation data set. Um, and then we're also setting up a sampler, which is a tool inside of uh, PyTorch that helps you uh, sample from a set of indices. So we have the train and validation indices here. We're putting them into this random sampler. Uh, and what that means is as we go through different batches in epochs of our training, um, they're always gonna be sampled. So you're not gonna get the same exact uh, batches in every iteration. Um, so this is actually kind of all we really strictly need, right? Like we have a data set, it's gonna be able to, when you pass it an index, uh, get the right image for us. We have this uh, sampler, train sampler, where when you call it, it's going to give us the, the next index that we need. Um, but PyTorch actually has another level of abstraction that you, you can use on top of that. Um, and what that is, is called a data loader. So what PyTorch data loaders do is uh, they basically take a data set and make it into an iterable. So you can pass it into a, a for loop that you're going to use in your training function that we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, and that can make it a lot easier for you uh, to prepare your data to be fed to a model for, for training. Uh, so the main parameter that we're going to talk about right now is, uh, or that you should note right now, is that it allows you to just put in a value for batch size. Uh, and then it handles, and here we have the batch size set as a variable, and then it will handle um, making sure that you get the proper batch size, or if you don't have enough to do a full batch, uh, giving you either the remainder of images, or there's some parameters to say you don't want it to do that. Um, so we're going to set up a loader for both the train data and the validation data. Um, and this is actually pretty much everything we need ready in advance to do our training. Um, so in this cell, we're actually just going to print out a bunch of the tensor sizes of like the, the feature batch shape. So this is the images that are being generated and fed in, um, the labels batch shape. Uh, the label for the image and a copy of the image. Um, so this allows us to see, like we have a batch size of 128. So for the feature uh, and labels, right, the first dimension is the, the batch size. So we can see 128. We see that we have uh, the one hot encoding of our four classes. This is what we expect. 
Um, and we can see for images that we have three channels of the red, green, and blue for the color. And the images have been cropped down uh, to 224. And this is, um, this is what we expect, right? Because we've done this center crop to get them to 224. So it's really important uh, whenever you're building a model in, in any kind of tool, right? To, uh, as you go through, don't just, you know, build your model and then look at the output and see if, you know, your accuracy looks good. Um, that can be that can be valuable, right? But you want to kind of check at intermediate steps along the way and make sure you're kind of preparing your data and passing things to your model that you think you're passing to your model. Um, so you know you're actually training the model to perform uh, in the in the kind of situations that you're going to want to use it. Um, so now we're going to talk about the model training loop in PyTorch. Um, so one of the unique things about PyTorch. Um, and a lot of other deep learning frameworks verse if you're used to working with, um, you know, scikit-learn or, or really a large variety of other more traditional ML tools, um, is you actually get a lot of control over what happens during uh, the whole training and validation loop. So here you can see a, a function that we've written uh, for train model. You can call this whatever you want. This, this is run outside of PyTorch. It's just something you run that calls a bunch of PyTorch functions inside of it. Um, and what this is doing is, is a few things. So first, um, the information up here is just uh, to track the start time of this function so we can time how long it took so we can print it out at the end. Um, and we're also gonna track both the best accuracy that we get and the best model weights. Uh, this way, if you know we train the model for 20 epochs, let's say, and at the 10th epoch, we get our best result and then it starts to get worse in the validation set over time. Uh, we still have a copy of that intermediate result that we can refer back to and use. The core of this function is this loop over here, um, which is going to run through the, the range of the number of epochs that you set uh, and print some diagnostic information. Uh, and inside of those, right, you're going to have both a train phase and a validation phase. So you can see here there a lot of these steps are gonna be the same, whether you're training or doing validation. Um, but some of the things to, to specifically point out that are different. So if you're in the train phase, uh, PyTorch has uh, this function that you can call on any model, which is dot train. Uh, and it looks like this is actually gonna train the model. Uh, that's not really what happens. So all that this does is prepare everything inside the model uh, to be trained, right? So there's certain things, let's say you, uh, we didn't talk about this much, but one common example is like dropout. Uh, so what you do in dropout is to try to uh, make sure that the output of your model is like more resilient or more generalized is during training, you'll kind of randomly ignore certain neurons. So they don't, you know, you can't uh, become too reliant on specific neurons or certain patterns. Um, so you could do that during training, but then when you actually go to use your model, right, you're going to want to turn all those neurons on and get the maximum possible value of what you have. Um, so there's changes like that that will happen when you switch between training the bell. Um, and then what happens is you're going to iterate over the data and go through um, a bunch of different PyTorch commands, like zeroing out uh, the optimizer, um, running the model on your inputs to get your output and predictions. Uh, you're going to calculate the loss here. Uh, and then if you're in the training phase, then we're going to do uh, this backprop step where we're gonna do the back propagation through the whole network. And then we're gonna uh, take a step of the optimizer um, to slightly improve the weights uh, of each of those neuron links that we have. Uh, the rest of this is just printing out information um, about statistics and you know, kind of keeping a tally of the running loss so that we can print those out at the end and things like that. So we've talked a little bit um, about transfer learning, right? First, I guess I wanna to touch on the idea that uh, you generally, even though you should understand the kind of things that we talked about with pooling, uh, with convolutional layers and activation functions, um, generally you don't need to, or you don't even actually want to uh, build an architecture from scratch. Um, like coming up with a good architecture is still a little bit of an, an art form, right? It can take a lot of uh, experience to do it really well and kind of know when you're optimizing the size of layers or now this time to add another comp, uh, convolutional layer or to, to downsize and do some pooling. Um, so instead you can typically just look at 
um, similar problems to the one that you're working on and try to find models that have already been uh, you know, developed by researchers to do really well uh, on that type of task. You can certainly modify those, but it's, it usually will save you a lot of time and get you a much better result uh, to kind of start building off of a general architecture that's been built. Uh, to facilitate this, PyTorch has a, a large library of um, like really popular and state-of-the-art model architectures that you can use. Uh, here we're going to use the ResNet 50 architecture uh, because it's been shown to work really well for am, uh, animal recognition. And Andrea, uh, one thing she talked about too was transfer learning specifically. Um, the general idea of transfer learning is that you're using what was learned on one task to solve another task. Um, large models, right, can require a lot of data to train. They can be really expensive if you have um, a model with a bunch of convolutional layers, you can get into the millions or tens of millions um, of parameters pretty quickly. Uh, so one common way to mitigate this is actually with transfer learning. Um, and here we're gonna use uh, PyTorch besides just having a lot of models where the architectures are available, right? Like this model ResNet 50 is there. Uh, you can also pass this pre-trained argument to get a pre-trained version that was trained on uh, the ImageNet database. It's just a really popular database with a thousand classes of uh, things that are identified in, in a millions of images. I don't remember exactly how many. Um, so now this gives us a model that has the architecture we want. Most of the feature layers have been trained. Um, but now instead of mapping this to a thousand classes, right, we're going to want to map that to four classes. Um, so that's what we're, we're doing here. We're importing this model. And actually, this command is to rescale uh, that final layer of the model. Um, to the, the length of our species uh, dictionary. So we know we have four, so it's gonna be mapping from exactly the same input, but only to uh, a four neuron output that we can match with our one hot encoding. Another thing that you can do is uh, you can actually freeze uh, different layers of your model. So ResNet, right, has, has 10 layers in it, um, the one that we're using at least. So here we're gonna freeze nine of those layers. Uh, so we're kind of maintaining everything up until this layer that we that we changed over here. Um, and this can really speed your training time because now uh, all that you have to do, right, is just train this one fully connected layer. All of the other features are already there. Um, that, so that's what we're doing uh, with this. And then this is going to show us uh, just as part of this function, it's downloading the model and then the number of unfrozen layers is just that one that we expect. Um, if you ever build a model or import a model and want to know more about it, uh, you can run a command like this, and this will actually print out kind of all of the layers and, and features that are inside of your model, right? So you can see we're starting with um, a convolution layer. You can see the kernel size. You can see the stride um, and just a bunch of different information of what's happening at every layer uh, inside of this model. Uh, we're not going to worry about this too much right now, but again, just to help you understand what, what's going on, it can be really valuable. Um, now we can do some final formatting of our inputs. Uh, we're not going to worry about this too much. And here we're doing uh, this BCE loss function, and we're just using uh, a stochastic gradient descent uh, optimizer. Um, and then we're going to actually just train the model. So what we can do here is um, definitely note right, that this, this is going pretty slow. Uh, so what we've done is kind of done this in the most naive way possible. Um, where we're just passing a bunch of information into, into this model. Uh, we can actually, um, I know we're, I, I want to make sure we don't go over time. So we can actually just let this run and come back to this in a minute. And I can start showing you uh, some of the kind of performance improvements that you can get in uh, Notebook 4. This is going to take probably on the order of like two or three minutes just to train uh, for this one epoch. So we'll go back to, to Notebook 3 in a minute and just uh, see how long that took. Uh, this notebook is pretty much the same, but I'm just going to focus in on uh, some of the improvements that were made to, that'll give you a lot more uh, or a lot better performance. So here we're importing all the same packages. Uh, the first thing, right, is, is GPUs. Um, so uh, some of you are, are on GPU nodes right now. And if you're not, don't worry about it. The code uh, will still run. Uh, so generally, uh, it's best practice for that reason. You never know if you're going to be on a GPU node when you run your code or if you send it to somebody else. 
uh, to do something like this. And instead of hard coding CUDA, which is, uh, refers to the GPUs, that you can set that to the value of a device if CUDA is available. Uh, and if not, you'll use CPU. So effectively nothing um, is gonna happen when you move something to the GPU. Um, this command is the same, right? Again, we're downsampling our number of classes to just 200 of each. Um, here we're building again a custom data set, but we've made uh, kind of one notable optimization. Um, so now in the get item, instead of what we were doing before, which was we were reading the image, uh, then we were passing it to be transformed. And the first step of that transform was this resize. Uh, now we're actually referencing a new method that we've added uh, called cache item. And what this does is it reads the image, does this initial resize, and then saves the smaller um, tensor uh, just directly to disk. So now anytime we go back and load this image, if this cache path exists um, here, we're actually just going to directly load uh, kind of that pre-scaled, uh, you know, pre-converted from image to tensor file, and that's going to be a lot faster. Um, and to understand how much faster that is, right? So in, in software development, uh, you generally don't want to put a lot of effort into making something faster unless you know that the part you're working on is actually the bottleneck uh, for what you're trying to do. Um, PyTorch has some built-in tools to help with this, but Line Profiler is a really good uh, Jupyter extension that help you actually, if you're developing models in a notebook, um, it can help you profile your functions line by line. Um, and that's how we identified that read image and resize were the slowest parts of that uh, get item method. Uh, so this is an example of what that could look like. Um, so we're loading in this extension, right? And then we have these uh, kind of two sets of functions where one of them is uh, the transform benchmark where we're showing kind of the original naive way of reading the image and going all the way through normalizing and stuff. And then the next one is uh, the next one is this cache transform, right? So here, all we're benchmarking is uh, the cache part of the transform because we're only going to do the read image and the resize once. So this is going to be more representative if you train for a lot of epochs how long it's actually going to take per image. Um, and you can see here, right? The old way takes 0.05 seconds per image. Um, Whereas the new one uh, takes about 0 0.008. So it's you know on the order of um, like 10, only 10% 10 of the time or so to pull each of it. So this means you can train your model uh, on the order of like, you know, maybe 10 times as fast. Um, and here we can see not just that there's a big time difference, right? But specifically uh, that 85% or so of the time is spent in just these two commands. Um, and that that goes down to, you know, uh, I think this is in, in milliseconds. So this is like 0.3 uh, milliseconds to pull that cached image in as opposed to um, 43 milliseconds or something that you have before. So that could be like a really big speed up for uh, you know relatively little effort. You just have to do something in the first epoch, epoch that we were gonna be doing already. Um, so here we have the same image transforms as we had before. Um, Note that, <clears throat> note that we've commented out this resize because now it's done uh, inside of the get item method in the data set. Um, and then we're going to go through again and prep all of the stratified split by uh, the same as we did before. Um, in, in the data loaders, there's actually two things that we can do um, in here. So one of those is uh, data loaders in PyTorch uh, support having multiple threads and multiple workers. So you could just tell them to use a number of workers equal to something more than one, and it will prepare a bunch of batches in, in parallel. Uh, so if you're on a uh, node with multiple CPUs, this can really speed up that time. Um, and the second thing is for pinning memory. Uh, so pinning memory, we don't have to get into the details of exactly what that means, uh, but basically because we're gonna be copying the data once we prepare the batch to the CPU, uh, pinned memory can make that a lot faster. Otherwise it still has to copy on the CPU uh, one more time before being sent to the GPU. Um, so if you're ever preparing batches on a CPU and then moving them to the GPU, uh, pin memory can, can save you a lot of time. The final change that we, we make here for performance is um, moving things to the GPU. Um, so we checked if the GPU is available earlier and here, right, we're moving our inputs and our labels uh, to the GPU.
we're also using that uh, to device on the model that we import. And the reason for this is that uh, first, that's we want to actually have that model on the GPU so we can get the benefit of the GPU time. Um, but PyTorch requires that a model, a batch, and the labels are all in the same location. So either on the same GPU or uh, on the same, or just in the memory on your machine uh, for the train to actually work. So here we've moved the model and we've moved the input and the labels all to the GPU. So now it's going to be uh, able to train. Um, and you'll note here that when we train this, the first epoch might be a little slower because it's going to cache uh, some of these images for the first time. Um, but we're already getting significantly faster results uh, than we got in the previous um, in the previous notebook. So even more so than uh, digging into things like hyperparameter tuning or optimization, um, this is one of the things I really wanted you to walk away with was kind of some ideas, and you'll be able to refer back to copies of these notebooks on the GitHub repo that we'll link um, of how you can improve the performance and training time of your of your models. Um, so this completed right five epochs in 26 seconds. And if we go back to the previous one, it was just one epoch in um, a minute and 50 seconds. So you can see we already got a, a pretty significant speed up. And there's definitely more types of speed up that you can get. Um, in here, you'll be able to uh, visualize kind of the output. So this is a predict predicted uh, label for this along with the image. And this can uh, you know, help you again understand kind of if the results your model match what, what you expect and just get a good benchmark or even just explain them to someone else you're working with. Uh, one thing I wanted to point out as an aside for performance is while a model's training, right, you'll, you'll generally want to confirm that it's actually making use of the hardware you think it should be running on and that it's making full use of that hardware. Um, if it isn't, that's a sign that you can do things like uh, you know, train maybe a larger batch size, use a larger model, do more things in parallel. Uh, so there's two commands that I just wanted to show you in here. Uh, so one of these is NVIDIA SMI. Um, and if you're not on a GPU node, I, I don't know that this command will work. Um, but what this does is this shows information about the GPUs in your system. Uh, this shows, right, we have this one uh, Tesla GPU, we have this much memory on the GPU used. Uh, and nothing's training right now, but if it was, it would show us the percentage of the GPU that was being used. Uh, similarly, for uh, you can run this command top. This is like a standard uh, Linux command that shows some of the most active processes. Um, so when you're training a model that's highly parallelized, you'll see um, a bunch of different Python workers showing up right, with varying amounts of CPU and memory, and that can help you also understand uh, if you're making good use of the, the hardware that you have available. Um, and finally, you may occasionally, uh, between trainings, want to clear some of the cache data for the GPU. Uh, it's like in this last notebook we're about to jump into. Um, we're going to want to make sure we have some of this GPU memory back. Uh, so what you can do here is just run this uh, PyTorch command to empty the cache from, from CUDA. Uh, and if we rerun this NVIDIA SMI, um, you'll see that we went from like 14 gigabytes uh, back down to about 2 gigabytes. Uh, so this can definitely be important if you have multiple notebooks uh, like we have here. Um, so I think, let me, I have probably two or three slides and then this one notebook. I think uh, we, I think we have time for this, right? If I remember correctly, this uh, workshop, we have up until uh, 2.30 for questions. Is that correct? Yeah, we've got time. Okay, great. Um, so now we're really briefly gonna go over uh, optimizing model performance. Um, we're not gonna go too deep into this, I'm just gonna kind of talk about some standard hyperparameters and things like that you may see uh, for CNNs. Again, I think it's actually probably more important um, for you to walk away with an understanding of how to actually get these models to work and how to get them to uh, train quickly so that you have more opportunities to optimize uh, your model and try different hyperparameters. Uh, so one of the types of hyperparameters or variables you're going to have here is the number of epochs, right? An epoch is the number of times your model is going to go through your entire training data set. Uh, the more epochs you have means that 
your model is going to have more iterations. So it's going to be able to converge more, um, but also that you're going to have to actually train through more iterations. So it may take more time for you to get a result. Um, and the same as with traditional machine learning techniques, um, if you go through too many epochs, uh, it's also possible for you to end up overfitting your, your model. Um, we touched a little bit on some of the different optimizers that are available. Uh, in the code we've used so far, we've used the cast a gradient descent. Um, and this will, you know, calculates the gradient on a batch of examples and then updates uh, the neural network one batch at a time. Uh, there's a couple of different ones here that you can, uh, if you're interested in, you can definitely go look into these. Uh, Adam right now is one of the more popular ones just because it's pretty, uh, it does some adaptive uh, estimation where it'll change learning rate kind of on the fly. Um, and this can make it a lot easier to tune because there's kind of less tuning, right, that you have to do. It's going to be adapting um, some of its hyperparameters over the course of model training. Um, and I've, I've mentioned learning rate. So learning rate is uh, generally one of the biggest uh, parameters for any kind of optimizer that you're going to use. Uh, and what this is, is some, some number between zero and one uh, that's going to control how large of a step the model is going to take in response to the estimated error for each, uh, like for the gradient or things like mm -hmm. that at each of the neurons you have. Um, so if you go through an iteration, right, and you find some error for a neuron and say, um, you know, looking at it in some direction that, hey, this neuron, um, we definitely want to move it more to the left uh, in this value of theta. By changing the, the learning rate, you're going to determine if you take really small steps, right, which might um, make sure that you end up in a good spot in the end, but it may take you a lot of iterations to get there. Uh, if you pick the right size for the learning rate, right, you're still going to kind of keep taking steps towards that minimum and then end up in the right spot. And this minimum is kind of reflecting the accuracy of your model or minimizing the error um, at each of these neurons. Uh, on the other side, if your step size is too high that you want to kind of rush and try to get to an optimal uh, value, maybe too aggressively, uh, you can actually end up taking steps uh, past the minimum in each direction. And it'll kind of the further away from the minimum you are, the bigger step you're going to take. Uh, so you'll find that your model actually diverges and you may never uh, get a good result. Uh, there are a couple strategies to, to deal with that. So there's um, basically all of these are different ways that you can uh, decay your learning rate over time. Um, so some of these are uh, to just decay kind of linearly, right? As you increase the epoch. So after X number of epochs, um, you drop down. Uh, you can also see that kind of done in more of a scheduled way where uh, it's dropped at a predetermined frequency. And then once you end up in a good spot, then you kind of leave it at a lower learning rate and maybe let it run for a while to get those last few percent out of your model. Um, and some of the optimizers we talked about, right, will do adaptive learning rates where uh, kind of based on the performance of the model and how quickly uh, it's training or if it starts to look like it's diverging, uh, they'll modify the learning rate so that you, you don't necessarily have to worry about that. Um, there's also kind of the set of all the layer parameters right inside your actual model architecture that you can tune. We're not going to get into that too much um, today, but maybe the biggest way we've mentioned that is by importing this ResNet 50 model, right? So if you wanted to uh, import a different model from PyTorch or something like that, that's going to be a pretty drastic way to do hyperparameter tuning where you're kind of changing everything at the same time. Um, but as you get more comfortable with uh, you know, using PyTorch, right, you have the option to maybe take that ResNet 50 model and add an additional convolutional layer to the end, or maybe change the size of one of the kernels somewhere in the middle of the model and, and have that trickle down into a, a different way uh, to get the same output that you want. Um, so these are just things to be aware of. Generally, again, you're going to start from a pre-existing model architecture. And as you get more familiar with why you may want to do certain things, though, you do have uh, the option to actually go inside of the model and change uh, very specific details at different layers of the model. Um, so now what we're going to do is, is kind of the last part of this workshop is uh, what's going to be sort of like a model tuning competition. So we're going to put you into uh, the last notebook, which is notebook five. Um, and then we'll put you into breakout rooms so you can kind of talk to other people for um, let's say on the order of like five or 10 minutes, you'll be able to try a few different hyperparameter values. 
Um, and let me show you on here. Um, so in this notebook, right, the early parts uh, are this, exactly what we just did in, are exactly what we did in notebook four. Uh, you don't have to really worry about these first couple cells. These are just con condensed versions of everything uh, that we did previously. Um, and below that, right, there's these few other cells with on the top, like a list of some things you can you could try. Uh, so here we have, we started with that first layer frozen or all the layers frozen of our model except the last layer. Um, but now we have the option that at some point during training, we want to unfreeze those layers, right? So maybe once we've got as much value as we can out of training that last layer. Uh, now we wanna go back and actually start training some of the pre-trained layers of the model and fine tune them a little more to our data set uh, that you have the option to do that. So you could change this value and have that happen at different epochs. Um, or you could set it to a large number, right? And have it effectively never happen. Um, here you could try if you want like different PyTorch models uh, that are available. So if you click on that link, you'll see um, some of the other models, like any of these strings uh, with pre-trained equals two uh, that, that exist inside of PyTorch that you can just use and they're gonna be pretty much ready to go. Uh, so you can try swapping out the model and see if that gives you um, a better result. Uh, one thing to keep in mind if you do that is uh, two things that are gonna be different about models is one, that final output layer isn't always gonna have um, that same name here, it's just dot uh, FC for fully connected. Sometimes it's going to be uh, linear. Sometimes it'll be something else. So you may have to look in the docs uh, to see what that value is. Uh, and they may have different numbers of layers. So if you have a model that only has three layers and you try to freeze nine layers of it, um, either this may not work or uh, you'll freeze your whole model, right? And then you won't actually be, be training anything. Um, and finally, then you'll be able to run through here and, and train and you can uh, change things like, you know, the batch size, you can change um, the optimizer you're using. So here we have bolts, the cast of gradient descent and um, atom. Uh, so you'll be able to kind of change those around and, and run this. I would probably limit yourself to um, maybe about 10 epochs. So that value is being set here just to make sure you get a result in a reasonable amount of time. And you could try a few different uh, like optimizations. Uh, and then once you're happy with the value you get, uh, then you'll be able to kind of uh, run this cell to just submit it up to a leaderboard. Uh, and then we'll close out the session by uh, just kind of looking at that leaderboard and, and maybe uh, if someone got a really high result, uh, letting them give a couple details about uh, what they did. Um, so I think we I think we could do that now and maybe we could put everyone in a breakout room until, uh, until 20 after uh, the hour. So it'll be about seven minutes.
Yeah, and so I think everyone uh, may be coming back uh, from whoever was in the breakout rooms. Uh, we can give people another uh, 30 seconds or so. Yeah, they should be in now. Um, all right, so if anybody has uh, a result that they want to submit, um, you can run that final cell to, to send that up. Um, it looks like Lisa maybe ran in, into an issue. Um, interesting. So you, if you, yeah, if you, even if you just want to post, uh, <laughs> even if you just want yeah. to post kind of what your accuracy was in the, the chat. The, it's, it's, it's an easy fix. It's uh, the directory and the last thing should just be results, not uh, tuning results. So just take out that mm -hmm. tuning dash. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yep, in here. Yeah, so GPU uh, definitely is going to be a lot uh, faster than than large, and it's actually interesting, right, to see even um, even though we're doing all of our data prep and getting our batches totally ready um, on the CPU, which was a pretty significant chunk of time, uh, even just training like that one that <laughs> that's fair, Thomas. <laughs> Uh, even, uh, you know, so I, I guess that's why, uh, that's why there's so much demand, uh, for, for GPUs now, right. Along with, uh, with Bitcoin and, and cryptocurrency. Um, <laughs> so for, I guess for everyone who has been able to submit, uh, to the leaderboard, you can feel free to keep playing with this and we're going to link to, um, a repo with this. So these are, uh, these are kind of the, the best results that have shown up so far. Um, so I think we, we have somebody got over, over 90%. So that's, that's pretty good. And they actually did that. It looks like by uh, maybe changing uh, the batch size to be a little smaller, um, still in about the same number of epochs. Um, uh, whoever this user is, uh, Fenderson, do you have any comments on maybe other stuff that you might've changed that got uh, your accuracy so high? Yes. Yeah, so let's see. So we got the epochs batch size. I played around with um, unfreezing the layers a little bit. So you had in there just unfreeze if it's epoch two. I made yep. it unfreeze if it's two or four. Okay. Um, so I couldn't really explain why that helped or how that helped, but you know, I was just playing around and found that it got me a slightly better result. Yeah, no, definitely that, that makes sense. Um, so that and there's also going to be some degree of randomness to this, right? Like you may end up, um, you know, just getting uh, batches or a validation set or somebody else that gives you um, maybe a, a slightly better result. Like definitely depending how you, what you're going to use this model for, if you want to have like really high confidence um, in your accuracy and also just get better results, right? You'll, you'll be able to feed it a little more data um, and improve it that way. But it can be uh, interesting to see even um, just how some relatively small changes uh, can can make a big difference. Uh, and again, I'm so, so let me. I'm looking at these uh, some new things that popped up in the chat. Um, so one of the questions is about using GPUs on a like an AWS machine rather than on a local instance. Um, so there's actually not necessarily a, a difference right between running this in the cloud versus on your machine. The biggest difference is going to be. Uh, what actual hardware is available. Uh, so it's likely uh, that the GPU that you have on your machine, um, unless you have a machine that was purpose built for, for machine learning or data science, um, that GPU is probably not gonna be as fast or as powerful um, as the GPUs that you may find um, in AWS. You also have the option on AWS, there's certain instance types like what we're using right now. We're not gonna go uh, too deep into this. Uh, you know, what we're using right now is a P3 instance. So if you look up any of the instance types on AWS, uh, here we're just using one GPU, right? But you have the, the potential for, uh, you know, you have the potential to use up to eight GPUs, or you can even use multiple machines um, and spread your training load across all of those machines if you want. Um, that's the biggest benefit of cloud, right? It's just the scalability um, and that you can use, uh, 
you know, like Thomas pointed out, right, that even just at one GPU, these are going to be like $3 an hour. Um, but if you only need to do your training on a GPU machine occasionally, you can run this on here for 10 hours and paying $30 to get a, a great model once you've already done a lot of tuning and stuff. Um, you know, that may be worth it, but you may not want to go and spend uh, the cost of actually buying one of these machines to, to have it all the time. Um, so that is pretty much it in terms of the workshop content, just to, to close us out. Um, just one really quick summary slide of some of the big takeaways. Uh, so things like, you know, well, uh, you'll want to understand what's actually happening inside of a model, right? I, I strongly recommend uh, that you use some pre-built architecture, uh, well, pre-built architecture, um, and even preferably a pre-trained model um, so that you can cut out a lot of your training time. Otherwise, you're paying, you know, all that cost to use, um, you're paying a lot of cost to use all those GPUs where, you're kind of just replicating the work that someone else has already done. That's a lot of the value of using pre-trained models is someone can go and spend thousands or millions of dollars uh, to train a huge model on GPUs. And then you can just kind of get the results of that for, for free. So you want to take advantage of that as much as you can. Um, you know, testing out different parameters can make a big impact on the results of your model. Um, and then especially as you're doing uh, big data models and things that can train for you know, hours or even potentially days, uh, any optimizations for speed that you can make um, can help you with reading and processing images and all the other things in here uh, with like running things on parallel. Uh, there's even things we, we didn't talk about, like if you have multiple GPUs, um, PyTorch gives you more control over splitting different parts of the model on different GPUs. So you can even you know, really heavily parallelize and make use of uh, a lot of hardware if you make it available to PyTorch. Um, so in here we have some other uh, we have some other resources uh, that you can link to. Some of these were referenced during this. We have uh, the tutorial materials are in this GitHub link, uh, and Andrea just posted actually the link to that GitHub repo uh, in there. Um, we have you know the PyTorch docs obviously, and also this three blue one brown. Um, set of videos that, that Andrea talked about earlier. Um, so thank you everybody for, for attending this training. We actually have um, this training, let me copy this link. We actually have this uh, link that we use for like all of our trainings and, and workshops. So if you wanna uh, give us any feedback on what you thought about it, we'd be, we'd be happy to hear about it so we can uh, you know do better in the future or keep doing what works. Um, yeah, now we have a, a few minutes. If anybody had uh, any questions, we can hang around. Cool. Thanks, Thomas. Yeah, just wanted to say thank you, everyone, for your attention. It's been fun. And hope everyone enjoys the rest of the conference. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, everybody. Just a quick note if you still want to, like, you know, talk about the tutorial and, you know, hang out with other folks. Um, you can do that in the Hubilo um, um, service uh, the, the, on which the, the conference platform. Um, I'll post a link in the chat. If you go here to the lounge and you'll see one for deep learning, um, that's for this tutorial, deep learning for data scientists, um, feel free to use it. Um, and just to answer uh, the question about these notebooks being available, I, we don't have any plans uh, to make these notebooks not available. Uh, so they'll be, they should be available uh, certainly for a while. Um, this, again, these instances, just because there's a bunch of uh, GPU and, and large CPU instances here, uh, this deployment is not gonna uh, be available uh, sometime by the end of the day uh, today, um, but you'll be able to go to that GitHub repo and pull down all the workbooks that you, that you used. Oh, um, someone asked, how do you download? Yeah, if you want to download the notebooks like with your changes, um, if you go to that project and you go into files, if you click on the notebook, um, there's going to be a button to download um, so that you can only do one at a time in here. Um, but if you did want like, hey, I made changes in this one, um, you're able to do that. Also, the three dots on the right would let you download it. So either one works. Yep. There's a yeah. And if you're inside of the workspace still, you can, um, I think, right click on either of these will also give you the option to download. So. Uh, sort of whatever you're most comfortable with.
Um, and yeah, another note, I'll leave this up, this deployment, I think till this evening. So if anyone, we'll shut down workspaces, but if you did want to come in and start one, um, probably till the end of the day. Play around midnight. Right. Yeah, well, I think, I think that's it. Um, Great. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you so much, uh, Josh and Andrea, um, for uh, or, um, teaching everyone about um, deep learning. And um, um, thank you, Andrea, for, oh, not sorry, not Andrea, um, Amanda, uh, for the closed captioning. And uh, thank you all for coming. And uh, we'll see you all at the conference. We'll see you all there. Take it easy. Bye.